Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're going to be looking at part three of my interview with my father, uh, a military veteran who served in the in the U.S. Army for 35 years. He served as a uh, private, moving on up to sergeant, uh, and eventually getting his commission in the Army, and then serving and retiring as a colonel. In the last video, uh, we got all the way up to the point where he basically talked to his commander about getting moved to Vietnam, and in this video, uh, we're going to talk about his experiences in Vietnam and his service in Vietnam. I think the one thing you're gonna you're gonna hear in this interview as we move into the Vietnam period is this is a very different kind of Vietnam story. There's a lot of similarities in this interview between Vietnam that you know in the in the media and the press about you know the ambushes and the uncertainty about who's really your friend and your enemy, but there's also a very different side that comes out that I don't think you hear a lot in the media, and that's the, you know, not everyone's dying fact. Um, I'll, I'll leave it to the interview to talk more about that, uh, but it was it was a striking interview, and obviously, you know, he, his role is, is not uh, being a combat infantryman going, uh, you know, rice paddy to rice paddy, although he did have some of those uh, units under him, uh, but his his principal role was that of a military police officer. However, in Vietnam, again, there was no real front line. So uh, you would think if the stereotypes of Vietnam uh, play out, you know, accurately, uh, that he may have a different experience in this interview uh, than, than perhaps, uh, or you may think he would have a different experience uh, than what he had, uh, at least what he conveyed in this interview. Um, so... Uh, with that being said, I'll leave that part of the interview to kind of stand on its own. Uh, just as a reminder, this is Order of Battle Pacific uh, that we're looking at here in this video. Uh, we are playing the Guadalcanal campaign uh, scenario from the Japanese perspective and advancing rapidly against the American forces. Uh, so we're having quite a bit of success. I'm not talking about the game itself too much in these last couple of videos, but these are playing through the Let's Play series that we had started previously. And I had a lot of footage that was laying around that I had never used. So I wanted to go ahead and uh, see about using some of it. Anyway, guys, uh, that's not really the point. The point of this video is to look at the third part and, again, my dad's experiences in Vietnam. Uh, so with that being said, why don't we go ahead and jump into the third part of this interview series of my father uh, for the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress. Remember, that's not the U.S. Congress itself. It's the basically the United States Archives um, or the United States Museum or Library, if you will. Um, and again, uh, let's go ahead and jump in. Part three of the interview of my dad for the Library of Congress. Hope you guys enjoy and, uh, uh, yeah, just sit back and enjoy. So uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to be selected to command the 560th MP Company in Vung Tau, Vietnam. And in addition to my headquarters and, and two platoons in Vung Tau, and, and we had an interesting mission, and I'll get to that in a moment, uh, I also had a platoon that was down in the Mekong Delta with its platoon headquarters was in a city called Canto. And then they had squads providing airfield security in uh, Sok Trang and Vinh Long, which were down in the Mekong Delta. So, before you go on with this, you're throwing a lot of names out there. Do you have, I mean, where, the base you were based at first, Long? Mekong Delta. Oh, initially, uh, north of Saigon, about 40 miles. It was clear, near Benoit, right. the, where I landed uh, in the airplane. So around the Saigon area. Yeah, it was in north. It was north of Saigon. Yes. All right. And then, what was the second, the headquarters for the unit you were just promoted to as the? Oh, commander? I was just assigned to. Yes. Vung Tau. Vung Tau, and where was that? Vung Tau is in the Mekong Delta. It, it's on the South China Sea, uh, about uh, forty or fifty miles south west of Saigon. So sort of. The or southeast of Saigon. Excuse me. Sort of the part of Vietnam that fits the. It was right on the Mekong River. Though. It was right on the Mekong River. And that area's terrain is sort of like what fits the stereotype for Vietnam, the jungle. Yeah, very much. Rivers, except Bung Tau was a city. Well, yeah. So you well, know, in that environment is what. I yeah, uh, when you when you got out from the city, uh, it was nothing but vegetation. All right. Yeah. Um, and I didn't mean to interrupt what you. Were That's saying. okay. In Bung Tau, we uh, had a very interesting mission. We provided 
Um, discipline, law, and order functions for the U.S. troops in Vung Tau. We also, in Can I mentioned that one of my platoons was in Kanto, and they provided discipline and order in Kanto, in addition to providing the air field security in Sok Trang and Vinh Long, which means they manned gates at those airfields to make sure that none of the bad guys got through the gates. And um, in Vung Tau, we had an additional mission, and as a result of that additional mission, I had a platoon, 50 men roughly, of infantry who were attached to my to my company and I was their commander. Combat and infantry? Combat infantry, yes, because we had several additional missions. Uh, in addition to discipline, law, and order, which of course only the military police provided, we had the mission to provide security for all of the shipping going coming into country and going up the Saigon River to the city, uh, to either Saigon or another port called Newport. And these were major ocean liners that, that carried uh, goods, you know, ammunition, uh, all kinds of military gear and paraphernalia. And it was our job to provide security. So the way we did that... This is the major supply route into... The major supply route into Vietnam, Vietnam yes, right. So my company provided that security. And what we did is we had three men on each of those big cargo ships going up the Saigon River, which was, as I mentioned, about a 40-mile 40, uh, 40 trip. Now, the way we got on there is we, we had a pier in Vung Tau, and we got on what was called a mic boat, which is kind of like, if you remember the, the films from World War II, like an LST, kind of like a landing craft, if you will. So we'd get on the landing craft, or get on the mic boat, we'd go out beside the ship coming into uh, coming up the South China Sea, getting ready to head up the Saigon River, and then we'd pull up beside them, and they'd drop down a Jacob's Ladder off the ship, and while the two boats, the, the Mike boat and the ship, were still moving, our men would actually crawl up the Jacob's Ladder and get on the boat, and yeah, then they would that. have... Oh, yeah, I did that a couple of times. And uh, one time was kind of interesting because uh, I, I happened to be on, on one trip where... Well, you know, when boats are moving, they have a tendency to, to come bounce back together, so you had to time it to, to get on the Jacob's Ladder when the boats came together. And one time, one of my troops started to fall between the boats as the boats were starting to come together, and my sergeant, being quick-witted like he was, reached down and grabbed the guy by the back of his belt and, and let the momentum of him swing him over into the mic boat. Now, he had a few bumps and bruises from landing on the bottom of the mic boat, but it was much better than being crushed between the, uh, the boat and the mic boat. So uh, at any rate, um, I also, I went on the trip a number of times. We had three people. We had a machine gunner, and we had a communicator, somebody who had a radio access to helicopter gunship support, and then uh, the third person was kind of the lookout, if you will. Um, and I, like I say, I made the trip on several occasions, and we came back the same way on the same ship and got off on the mic boats the same way. But um, I was not on this one particular trip. There was one trip uh, the, on a ship called the President Buchanan. It was part of the Likes Lines at the time, L-Y-K-E-S. And they were attacked uh, halfway up the Saigon River. The intent of the attack apparently was to ship the or it was to sink the ship in the channel so that other shipping couldn't move on the river. Well, our guys fired back, uh, and uh, I, I heard about it, of course, and I immediately was able to get helicopter support. I went over to our air, our air base at Bung Tau, got a helicopter to take me up to uh, the area. Of course, everything was over by then, uh, but it turns out that our guys ended up killing four Viet Cong, and we, we actually got a body count doing that. And uh, those, those men got uh, a citation for uh, their, their uh, actions in that particular day. Um, there were several other smaller attacks, but that was the only one where actually rockets were, were fired into the ship. We found 11 holes in the side of the ship later on where the rockets came into the ship. But for whatever reason, they didn't call it, cause any serious damage. And uh, I guess the ship was maybe too big for that kind of a munition. 
But um, uh, that was kind of an interesting thing that occurred on that, that particular uh, mission that we had. Another mission that we had, uh, which was far more interesting in many ways, was there was a thing called the People's Road Project. Uh, it was in a place called Dong Tam, which is on the Mekong River. The, the army was building uh, a facility uh, in the town of Dong Tam, and the way they got the materials and supplies was on tugboats that came up the Mekong River from Saigon. They came down the Saigon River, then up the Mekong River to Dong Tam with whatever supplies they needed to build this facility out. Well, uh, again, I had three people on those, and they had a 50 caliber machine gun, uh, an M16, and a communicator, again, who also had an M16, of course. On one of those trips, uh, the, these, these uh, tugboats were commanded by Filipinos who were under contract to the military over there. And it was run by a company called Alaska Barge and Transport Company. And on one of the trips in April of 1968, uh, this was after the Tet Offensive, and I'll come back to the Tet Offensive, but uh, these, uh, the Philippine tugboat captain apparently got bribed and instead of stopping at Dong Tam, continued on into Cambodia with my three men abroad, aboard. They couldn't get him to turn around. Of course, they didn't know how to run the boat. They, they were soldiers. So they ended up being prisoners in Cambodia. And, of course, we, we had no idea what was going on. I mean, we knew what happened because they communicated, but we couldn't, we couldn't stop it. So they, they were in Cambodia as prisoners, and, of course, I got, you know, the, all the information. I wrote their parents, told them the full story, said we don't know what's going on with them. We haven't heard one way or the other. And probably one of the few good things to come out of, of the assassination of Bobby Kennedy in April of 1968 is that the Cambodians gave them back as a gesture of goodwill. Uh, so the Cambodians, when Kennedy was killed, they said, we feel bad for you, here you yeah, men back? exactly. At least that was what they said. What can oh. I say? So they came back in, and they were really none the worse for wear. They were treated reasonably. They, it wasn't like they were in the Hanoi Hilton or anything like that. That was Cambodia. Not, uh, I, I don't say there weren't Vietnamese involved with that, but they were treated reasonably well. Is that, I mean, I mean, is that a problem you ran into sometimes with your private contractors being bribed, or was this a one-time? In Vietnam, because the enemy and your friends had the same appearance. It was always something you were conscious of, you were alert to, you were always paranoid. I had Vietnamese contract workers working for us in my company headquarters. I had two mechanics, a young boy and an older man. I had a secretary, those were the only three. And we were always concerned. You never knew where their loyalties were because at daytime they were one thing, at nighttime they might be something else entirely. So um, we never knew exactly what was going on, but let me now go back to the Tet Offensive, which was in late January of 1968. Actually, it was, uh, we were in a very interesting location. Uh, I mentioned we were in the city of Vung Tau, or actually on the outskirts of Vung Tau. And um, when I had first come, come to that area in, in September of 1967, uh, the fellow uh, who was a fellow named Grady Sockwell, who was a major, was the Provo Marshal of that area, again, like the Chief of Police. And he took me around to various uh, parts of the city to, you know, kind of get acclimated to what was going on around there. And. Uh, he took me over to an area uh, on the north side of, of well, actually, Vung Tau was located on a, on a geog geographical feature called Cape St. Jacques, uh, Cape St. John, uh, and, uh, or Cap St. Jacques. He took me to an area over on the north side of the Cape. The U.S. operations were pretty much on the south side of the Cape. And we pulled up into a kind of a secluded area and looked out, and he said, look out, and we, there was a beach there because we were on the South China Sea. 
And he said, uh, look out into that area. And I looked out, and here were all these young Vietnamese men. And I said, who are they? I said, are they, you know, citizens of Vung Tau? He said, no, they're North Vietnamese. I said, I beg your pardon? He said, yeah, they're, they're actually, uh, they have their own what's called rest and recreation uh, center here in Vung Tau. The U.S. Forces Rest and Recreation Center was in Vung Tau as well. So apparently there was a situation where our enemies and us were in the same city relaxing away from the war for three days because that was basically your R&R &R time was three days kind of getting you away from combat for a period of time and they came to our city to do that they didn't mess with us and we didn't mess with them so it was one of those unwritten and kind of silly or stupid rules of war and I know we've heard of those things over the years when we hear about that famous Christmas thing that happened with the Germans during World War II and that sort of thing World War One, I, I guess it was yeah anyhow um, so that was kind of interesting. Anyhow, back to, back to the Tet Offensive. Because of the fact that North Vietnamese and U.S. troops were in Vung Tau, we were very fortunate in that Vung Tau was not attacked for that reason. Is that the only major base that wasn't Yes, there? about the only major city in Vietnam that was not hit, uh, American-dominated city, if you will, that was not hit. So, um, but... There were occasional skirmishes, and there were occasional situations. I mentioned that we had a mechanic, a young fellow and an, and an older man. Matt, the older man must have been in his 60s, but they, they were very good mechanics. They kept their Jeeps in good running order. But um, during the Tet Offensive, uh, we got a call on the radio from one of our patrols in town that our older mechanic was pinned down in his home, and his home had been destroyed, which it had. So I took a small contingent of men, and we got in the back of a what's called a deuce and a half or two and a half ton truck that had armor on the side of it, and we drove into Vung Tau, and we picked him and his family up, and we we heard quite a bit of gunfire. We caught a few rounds on the side of our vehicle, and uh, we we got him and his family out safely, but his home was pretty much destroyed. Somebody had tossed a Molotov cocktail or some kind of a firebomb of some kind into his home. Uh, we don't know why. But at any rate, we got him back out safely, so that was good. My secretary, I never saw again, which tells me one of two things. Number one, she was loyal to the Viet Cong or, or the North Vietnamese, or she was killed. I'm not sure which. Um, but um, so the Tet Offensive had some impact on us, not as much as it did in, in Saigon. Frankly, if I had gone to the, to the unit that I mentioned that I was originally assigned to in Vietnam, the 716th MP Battalion, they lost 19 men during that uh, particular situation. So I, I feel very fortunate that that occurred, that, that I was not assigned to that unit. Nonetheless, um, uh, after the Tet Offensive, I mentioned that I had a platoon of infantry attached to my unit, and their job, another mission that we had, in addition to discipline or law enforcement in Vung Tau, river security on the Saigon River, river security on the Mekong River, I also had another job, and that was we provided, we did uh, search and destroy missions throughout the uh, area where we were located. Uh, going through the various villages in the Mekong Delta, uh, basically looking for Charlie, as we call them, or, or the VC, or uh, they were mostly VC. The North Vietnamese weren't operating down there yet. So um, we, we constantly had uh, people um, out in the jungles, if you will, and occasionally encountered some snipers from time to time. Nothing truly serious ever really happened. Uh, but, but it was an interesting period of time. I will say that this was about the time, uh, if I can delve into politics for just a moment, um, this was about the time that a certain senator who ran for the presidency of the United States had uh, a swift boat uh, situation in south end of the Mekong Delta, 
And part of my job uh, in the Mekong Delta was to provide uh, all of the law enforcement support throughout the Mekong Delta. During my entire six months commanding the 560th MP Company, there was never one single incident reported of any atrocities of any kind throughout the Mekong Delta. So you, you always have to take stories that you hear like that with a, with a big grain of salt. They, they, uh, and I certainly would have heard about it because I had eyes and ears all over the Mekong Delta, both some Vietnamese because I worked with what were called the QCs or the, the Quan Con, which is the Vietnamese military police, as well as our own military police. Uh, they came under my command as well when we performed uh, law enforcement duties. In, uh, in Canto, the only thing that really happened there, during the Tet Offensive, my men were stationed in, in an old uh, billet or an old three-story building there. And during the Tet Offensive, some uh, VC came up uh, on the river that runs through Canto and they fired rockets into the side of the building where my men were stationed. Uh, fortunately, all the rockets hit fairly high on the wall and while it showered my men with uh, debris from, from the concrete that the buildings were made out of, and some men, uh, actually one man, uh, uh, protected several others by, by being on top of them, if you will, getting on top of them so that they wouldn't be injured. Um, he ended up getting a soldier's medal. But um, we, we didn't have anything serious happen there other than a half dozen rounds or so through the side wall of the building. But I was there the next day, and it was a real mess, I can tell you that. But um, we were fortunate nobody was hurt. When I went down to visit my troops in Canto, and, and Canto was about, oh, I'd say 50 or 60 miles from Bung Tau, I would go down, I would basically hitch a ride on a helicopter and, and hitch a ride back. And on one of those trips back, uh, I happened to hitch a ride on a helicopter coming back to Vung Tau. It was a, a medevac helicopter. And we were about 10 minutes out of Canto heading back toward uh, Vung Tau when they got a medevac mission. So, and, and what you see when, when somebody wants you to land at a certain place is someone will throw a smoke grenade, and usually purple, uh, to indicate a landing space. So we saw this purple smoke coming from, you know, on the radio. They got the location and everything. So we started to go down to, to pick them up. And of course, we took on some small arms fire from the VC at that point in time. And you could hear the, literally hear the rounds pinging around inside the aircraft. And I was sitting in the side of the aircraft, because this is one of the jobs when you hitch a ride, I, I was sitting manning a 60, uh, M60 machine gun, uh, and then I had a, a little belt around my waist holding me in the airplane or in the aircraft, because the doors are open when, when that occurs, so you're flying with the doors open, so it's kind of weird. But nonetheless, uh, we, we took on some small arms fire, and I, and I you know, fired some suppressive fire to try to keep that down. And we landed, and it turned out to be a Vietnamese unit, not an American unit. And there must have been 15 or 20 men, most of whom were already dead. And they already they just tossed them into the to the the floor of the of the helicopter. It was a Huey, of course. That's all we used in those days. And um, you know, basically, we had people uh, just scrambling to get on the helicopter. We barely got everybody on and lifted off. And as we were lifting off, of course, we heard some more small arms fire. But we were able to, to keep that down. I was able to fire the M60 machine gun to, to kind of suppress that fire, if you will. But uh, fortunately, we got back, and we did have some hydraulic problems. And when we got back to the air base, and actually what had happened, one of the rounds that had been fired at us had had... Uh, cut a, a hydraulic line, and what that controls is your ability to control the aircraft. And uh, it took them about uh, an extra five or ten minutes to land the aircraft because they had to bounce it several times because they didn't have full control of all of the uh, things that helped it land. But anyhow, we got back safely, and uh, that was that was okay. But uh, yeah, a lot of interesting things happened there. Um, one thing I didn't mention, uh, when I first got to Vietnam, I, I did something really stupid. I, uh, 
I wanted to go down uh, to uh, visit uh, a unit that was down in the Mekong Delta. And my driver and myself headed down what was called Highway 15. We were heading down to where the headquarters for the 9th Infantry Division was, in a place called Bearcat. And uh, we were heading down the road, and we got into this one village, and we were passing through. And again, here we are, just two guys in a Jeep, you know. And of course, we had weapons and everything. And we started taking on some gunfire. So that was a little weird. I mean, you know, we, we one of them uh, crashed through the windshield and uh, that sort of thing. But fortunately, we got through there. We, Needless to say, we went pretty fast to get out of there. Uh, as the Vietnamese say, DDML, that means you go pretty quick and get out of there. And uh, so we got out of there pretty quickly. So I got fired on a few times. Uh, fortunately, I was never hit. And we did come under fire, uh, again, back to the 560th in Vung Tel. We actually came under mortar attack one day. And we had our little bunkers uh, s spread throughout the area. We used old Connex containers, which are things that sh are used to ship things on ships coming over these metal containers. And they had sandbags around them, so our, our people all got into those, uh, those Connex containers, if you will, protect themselves. And uh, I had one sergeant, again, who will go unnamed. We had two four barracks that we'd built there. And we built one of them while I was there, and we built a mess hall while I was there. He jumped off the second floor uh, landing, if you will, from the barracks and sprained his ankle and tried to claim the uh, Purple Heart. And I refused to put him in for it, refused to recommend him for it, because even though it was a direct result of hostile fire, uh, he was not injured by hostile fire. He was injured because of being over-anxious, let's call it. Do you have any men in the Purple Heart? I had, yeah, I had several, absolutely. As a matter of fact, the men in the barracks uh, in Canto uh, that were hit by some uh, concrete uh, shards when the rockets came through the wall, they, they earned the Purple Heart. Most of my men, they're, they're, it was amazing. I had a, a great group of people. Um, they, in addition to their regular duties, which they were 12 on, 12 off, seven days a week, during their 12 hours off, they volunteered with the local gunship uh, units and flew as door gunners on, on helicopter gunships and many of them earned what's called the air medal which, which can only be earned if you're in hostile combat firing, uh, flying in combat missions. Uh, that kind of, they, they kind of tried to stop doing that later on uh, by the time I, I left that command but uh, it was it was amazing. I had I had guys that had medals. So during uh, their off time. So during their off time. Men were volunteering for possibly higher risk assignments. Absolutely, they... absolutely. They were doing it all the time, and you know that's the nature of the American troop. I think I think they always want to do what's right. Um, maybe it's uh, adren maybe they're adrenaline junkies, or maybe they're uh, just uh, ultra patriotic. Uh, you know what was going on, I think, during uh, in the United States back in that 67, 68 time frame was not very pleasant. Um, we had a lot of anti-war activity taking place. Uh, I can tell you that uh, uh, Hanoi Jane was not considered in high esteem by any of my troops, and I would say that most of them would, would like to have seen her been tried as a traitor, quite frankly. And who is Hanoi Jane, just for the... Jane Fonda, daughter of Henry Fonda. Uh, who went to North Vietnam and collaborated with the North Vietnamese during that same time frame. And anyhow, that's political and I'll stay away from that. But nonetheless, um, it was a very interesting six months. Well, in April of 1968, I was fortunate to be selected to be promoted to major. And as a result of that promotion, I could no longer command the 560th MP company. And um, so I was transferred back to Long Bend where I then became the uh, S-4 or logistics officer for the 89th Military Police Group. And I finished out my tour uh, April, May, and June, uh, actually April and May, and then I returned to the States in, on the 1st of June um, to an assignment. Well, initially, um, I had 30 days leave when I first came back, and of course I spent that with the family, and then moved the family down to my next assignment which was at Fort Gordon, Georgia, 
where the military police school was located so that I could attend what was called the military police officer career course. Right. And that was in uh, June, started actually in September of 1968. All right, and just before we leave the subject of Vietnam, um, I guess this might be more appropriate for your supply tour later in the war. Yes. Um, all right, folks. Well, you know, that just about does it for this video once again. Um, I hate to jump in in the middle of his Vietnam stories, but uh, again, we got to about the 30-minute mark on this video, and I thought that would be a natural stopping point. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and do just that. We're going to go ahead and stop the video here. And we will pick up with a fourth part in this series uh, before too long. Now, what we may need to do from a video perspective, because the battle for Guadalcanal is coming out uh, and will be over shortly, is we may need to combine the end of the Guadalcanal and the beginning of the next uh, battle into a single video. I don't usually do that. Usually I try and keep things separate. Uh, but frankly, there's going to be nine or you know, eight or nine minutes of the Guadalcanal battle left and I don't want to make an eight or nine minute video. So if the trend is to try and focus on continuing the uh, series with my father, uh, I think it would make sense to just kind of merge the beginning of the next battle and the end of this one into one video and then kind of explain over that in a follow-on video where we, we kind of recap everything that happened in these, in these fights uh, when the real focus was on the interview and not so much uh, what the gameplay was doing. I do hope you guys enjoyed the video. Um, you know, this is, uh, again, this is an interview that I conducted for school uh, with my father. This is the third part of the series. If you haven't seen the earlier videos, please go back and check. Um, again, I'm overwhelmed by the amount of support and interest uh, that my uh, followers and just general YouTubers have expressed in this. I think it'd be really cool if we could get other veterans to kind of share their stories, uh, maybe do interviews with them. Maybe not even just for my channel, just in general, kind of share uh, veterans' experiences uh, in their armed forces, whether they served in a combat zone or not. Um, you know, they were still serving for uh, for the United States of America. And to those of you who are not, um, you know, American citizens who are watching this, I'm well aware that YouTube goes out to millions and, and billions of people all over the world. Um, but, you know, this is me telling the story of, or my father telling his own story. So whether you're an American or not, I hope you can still appreciate that every country around the world has brave men and women who stand the walls and defend their freedoms. Uh, well, at least every country that's probably watching this anyway. Um, anyway, guys, that's about it. I'm going to just start rambling if I don't cut myself off here. So again, hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, you can see here the battle for Guadalcanal is going well in the uh, video game. And um, until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying thank you for watching, and I'm out.